How exciting was it seeing the full gameplay trailer of Nightingale at Gamescom? I have gave you my opinion quite a bit, but there are interviews out there. One today I'm going to cover from IGN, but even more exciting, I've been given some exclusive B-roll footage to show you, showing off so much more of the game, so I'm going to cover that while I also talk over this interview with IGN. If you somehow haven't caught my earlier videos, Nightingale has now been delayed until February the 22nd of next year. But the good news is it's given more time to get this game even more polished. I'll actually have my first hands-on impressions that I'm going to be delivering you to tomorrow. So make sure you go and check out that video and obviously make sure you like in this one and subscribe to get the most out of Nightingale info and guides when the game's here. But yeah, this is the trailer that you've probably seen. Let's talk over that B-roll footage and some of that info we got from some of the interviews. As you might expect, there is lots of things subject to change. They may decide to jettison some features or just really revamp stuff. So take everything you're seeing with a pinch of salt, but the B-roll footage is looking really good. The character customization you can see here is super, super in depth with the different choices of color of your eye, the hair and more. And you can see the third person mode, which they've introduced recently. Get a bit more detailed look about the basics of crafting there, a typical sort of survival gear, pickaxe, axe and knife and straight into some combat with some of these guys. Cross between like rats and kangaroos. You can see obviously the big red health pool there and the yellow one does seem to be the stamina since it's draining as you're in combat. We've got the missions on the top right and then we've got all our tools and weapons on the left with some sort of buffs above the kind of dial in the middle. Using your ax you can actually block creatures and seemingly push them away. And we know that we're using a crude tool set here, as it says it on the bottom right. We are going to be skinning creatures. I just hope it's not going to be too tedious and long like Red Dead Redemption 2. By looks of things, it wasn't that bad. And now we've got enough materials to go ahead and craft a actual coat. So there's actually eight different equipment slots there. And we've even got an offhand slot for our torches and maybe other stuff. Then we get to see the base building. It's a blueprint system. As you can see the basics here, these are like the crude wooden set. That's gonna be the stuff that you build with first. And just like other games, you'll be able to go ahead and then auto add to it your resources or just do it manually by yourself. And you can see the little time lapse, which is really cool to see. And later on in this footage, you'll see it transform into kind of the Asian influence pagoda set. So pretty creative, all the different crafting benches, the pot plants, and then building the portal. Obviously the crucial element of traveling to different realms and getting better resources or coming across unique creatures. So the crafting bench here is just on its own and then we're actually adding a crystal ball to it. So is this the way that you craft the cards? It seems to add the resources to it and then this might open up the ability to then get the cards themselves, as you can see, needing paper, ink, and maybe essence. Now we've heard about the cards before, there's going to be major cards and minor cards and they'll determine what kind of biome you'll go into, what kind of enemies you will face, what kind of environmental effects you might have to deal with. And then we're loading up the actual portal with a, as you can see, a biome and a major card. You need both of them before you can actually progress and then add in some sort of creature cards or some other kind of modifier. And then the portal is actually opening up. It's some really cool effects. I really like it. The game is looking absolutely astounding. The Unreal Engine obviously showing it off in the best light. Something else I noticed is all of the different buffs or debuff signals as well. Again, even more opening up. Then we get some beautiful vistas. Look at these airships in the sky and some crazy, crazy locations with weird enemies. We've seen the automatons involved in other trailers and just a huge amount of points of interest as well as the Yotun, the tree gods, I guess that's meant to be guarding some of the trees maybe. I think I want a bit more firepower than just this axe, although the axe does look pretty impressive to take on this bad boy. So I've already seen like two different environments now. We've got a desert environment with these kind of tree ant creatures, and then we've got like a mix of elephants and rhinos there. Very, very cool looking. Love the vistas. I, if this game doesn't win the prettiest game awards come the end of the year, I'll be very surprised with some foreboding entrances to maybe points of interest, caves, temples, or even maybe boss hideouts. Nice little sunset vista as well in the forest and some examples of you playing with your friends. Do get a sense of like new world here with some of the structures being quite similar and they have got similar, I guess, ideas in terms of fae or fairies and stuff. But obviously this is set in a much more contemporary world. 
Not sure if this is player built off its point of interest. It does look a bit too crazy to be player built, like all them sort of Shrek huts being expanded, and whether or not some of these are player built, it may be just points of interest, with the weather lashing down in third person mode, and of course coming up against some of the harpy creatures, again, that we've talked about and seen a lot of. And yet, we're going to be Mary Poppins singing our heart out as we land on Apex creatures and hopefully not get munched on. Yeah, this is pretty cool mechanic. I did think it was a bit odd and a bit too twee, but I'm getting used to the, the actual umbrellas being something we can utilise. Now, this is the first time I'd seen guns actually been firing. We saw it in the trailer. It looked pretty bombastic with sort of big orange glowing balls to shoot at creatures and going through a huge cave system or temple here, taking on the bound. So hit numbers are popping off, you're always going to know exactly what kind of damage you're doing to creatures. Although we've still got the starting gear in the little UI, the HUDs there, so yeah, that's interesting. Now this is really cool, this is where we get to see the transformation from just the basic twig set to something much more luxurious. This was only just announced at Gamescom that they're going to have this kind of pagoda Asian influence, and it looks mad, it looks so pretty. I'm also blown away by the amount of detail and how much clutter. I thought I was stepping into my granny's living room with so many ornaments and items just on these benches and tables. It's a really paradise for decorators and base builders to customise and have a base or home looking exactly how you want it to. So we know the crystal balls have some use, perhaps some of the other stuff does too. And now the workbench has got a plethora of different tools and items to go ahead and craft, including a pretty cool looking shotgun. Eclair Paradox Shotgun, seemingly some sort of rare variety. It looks like it's purple. Then you've got other varieties of the resources basically being common and uncommon, I'm guessing. With a whole host of them giving and delivering more different varieties of buffs and stats. So what you use really determines what your items are going to be. And obviously that contributes to the gear score that we've heard about before. Incredibly ornate here. I can see why maybe this game it hasn't been touted for console just yet, as it, I swear it's got to be tanking people's PCs. And then we finish off with a sneak glimpse of all the different rarities of items, ammo, ores, minerals, and of course clothing. So there we go, that is the B roll footage that was supplied to me by Inflection Games. A big shout out to them. I'm going to go over the Nightingale interview they did with IGN as we go over some of that footage once more. Of course, I'll leave a link to the full interview in the comment section down below so you can read it yourself. So this is by Alex Simmons and he's basically saying that just like other survival games, you'll be doing the basics, picking up sticks and leaves and trying to cook nasty tasting berries just to keep the hunger at bay, but pretty soon it becomes something much more impressive. Axes are pretty simple to craft early on, extremely useful for chopping down trees, which can then be turned into logs. Before long, you have enough to build a symbol log cabin, nothing too fancy, but it provides shelter from both the elements and local wildlife. I wasn't able to play Nightingale Gamescom 2023, but the developers did showcase how it's created a simplified crafting system designed to make building anything from simple tools to impressive buildings quick and easy. So much so, in fact, that within a few minutes our base has expanded to include additional rooms and levels, plus crafting benches that enable you to build bigger and better things. Moments later, we're able to upgrade once again, switching out bland log panels for ornate pagodas. If this is what life is like when you're on the brink of survival, count me in. At its most basic, Nightingale is a survival game like Sons of the Forest and Valheim, but it's doing a disservice because it's by far the most stylish and elegant survival game I've ever seen. The Realm Walkers are the epitome of Victorian chic and even managed to make an animal skin look great, and the way they use umbrellas to glide from high ledges smacks a breath of the wild crossed with Mary Poppins, and it's wonderful. The gas lamp vibe is mentioned a lot by the guy in the interview, and then obviously you've got encounters with Lovecraftian creatures, as he calls it, and the bound. They talk about some of the stuff the devs have spoken about before, that you come across a giant and you've got two ways to approach it. You can either try and take it down or hopefully appease it with some sort of gift. But obviously this is now the sun giant, the new variant that we are seeing, I guess, or maybe it's replaced the old one. And it seems like things haven't gone well as three of the realm walkers try and take on the giant, carrying shotguns and rifles, even actually firing at the giant from sniper nests that they built from their multi-story pagoda build pieces. It seems like this giant absolutely demolishes this pagoda, and yeah, combat is pretty fast, but considered. Ammunition is extremely limited, every shot counts, and therefore hitting one of the Son giant's weak spots, in this case either its head or the medallion around its neck, is crucial. The giant obviously fires a burning light arc across the battlefield, 
These blasts create heat which you can use to your advantage using your umbrella to ride the updraft into the sky to attack from above. That is pretty cool, that is something I've not seen any mention of before, almost Monster Hunter style attack formation. The game doesn't scale difficulty if you're part of a smaller party, the rewards are bountiful and you'll obviously get new stuff to craft better items. You'll also get realm cards as a reward, so these will obviously be opening up new dimensions via the portals, but there's no set reward for defeating a creature like this. It'll be randomly given to you what kind of card that you get. It could be a swamp, it could be a forest, or it could be a desert. You'll have to go through the quest line and then visit some of the larger realms to uncover the story of the game and the mysteries. But they're keen to point out that choice is really integral to the game, not just following the story. You'll have the mainline quest when you start, Puck, who's going to be your NPC guider. The quest will give you rewards and incentivize you to do stuff, but they do want players to be able to do their own thing with their friends. According to Aaron Flynn, who IGN seemingly got an interview with as well, each of the realms is about two kilometers squared, and there's some that have to visit to follow the quest, but part of the fun is also seeing what else is out there beyond those compulsory locations. Lots of points of interest would have maybe rewards, as long as you're curious enough to go towards them. And Flynn says that one of the overarching umbrella statements he loves is the endless adventure that Nightingale has. We want you to go on endless adventures as you play these cards, to think about what you want to do, maybe even play with friends, and discover things you haven't or couldn't go to just by yourself. The interviewer goes on to talk saying that although it's a survival game, the focus is on exploration, having a good time. You do need to eat and rest and adapt your strategy depending on the environment you're in, but it never gets in the way of soaking up what's around you. So items for clothing for certain environmental effects. So all in all, pretty impressed by the sounds of things from IGN there, and I am obviously impressed as well by all the footage I've seen so far. As I said, my hands-on impressions will be going live tomorrow, so you can see what I really feel about the game. I was kind of sad that the game got delayed until February, I kind of was really expecting it to come out this year, but with the improvements they're making, it does seem like it's going to be worth the wait for sure. Nightingale really is shaping up to be obviously a starting hit for maybe 2024, and I think this is going to be a massive game, let alone just survival. Go and check out that full article, I did leave a few bits out for you to go and read over if you really want to, and I'll be back like I said with my impressions tomorrow. Until then, rat bags. I'll catch you for more Nightingale news in the future. Bye bye.